point out that synchronicity is not a typo, and I'll elaborate about it. It's inspired by Lego. Uh, so let's get, get started. So, what my proposition is that how do you go beyond MOOC? Well, my proposition is two part. In the first part, what I'm claiming is that we need to squeeze more out of CMOS. And to do that, we can adopt ASIC style implementation because it simply gives us two to four orders of better energy delay product, the same metric that Subash has used, compared to the run-of-the-mill cots like GPUs, FPGAs, VLIWs, and things like that. And if you combine that with the technology that was proposed by Subashish, we can go up to like six orders better. Okay. Now the second part of my solution is that to complement CMOS, not just replace it with some emerging technologies, including the one that we heard in the previous talk, like adopting. Okay. Should I take it in hand or something? Uh, is to adopt this 2.5D or 3D integration, and if this uh, monolithic uh, integration becomes available, that much the better. The other is to use computation in memory using memristors, using the resistive RAM, and we also have the uh, same partners, CLT, and uh, something more exotic like plasmonics can be used to get another uh, uh, order of magnitude improvement. Now these are the solutions to going beyond MOOC. But as I think uh, Venki Ramakrishnan pointed out that science makes progress not just when you have a solution, but when you make the solution easier to use. And that's where the concept of synchronicity inspired by Lego comes into place. So without much further ado, let me try to introduce what is this concept of synchronicity that sounds so similar to synchronicity that we are all familiar with. In fact, it's a spatial analog of synchronicity. So let's get started with synchronicity that everyone in this room understands and why did we adopt synchronicity as a design style to start with. So in synchronicity, we did two things. One is that we discretize the time with the clock ticks and not just discretize them, we discretize them uniformly. What's the advantage? By doing that, we sort of abstract away the details. We only need to bother about what happens at the clock edges. Okay, so we can go for more complex systems because now we have fewer details to deal with. The other advantage that it brings is that when we design digital systems, the data parts yeah, that are synchronous, yeah, and if their clocks are skew aligned, we can temporally compose them, yeah, as you can see there. Synchronicity is derived from the Greek word chorus, stands for space, in that rather than discretizing the time, we discretize the space. And now we do that with the virtual grid, and we design synchronous building blocks that we call as silicon level blocks or silago blocks. So that occupy integer number of these grid cells, and their edges that are relevant are made functionally compatible and they compose by abutment. So you don't have to do anything more than that to create abutment. Okay? So that's the advantage that we get. Now, Salago blocks or the silicon Lego bricks are the new standard cells and they have these properties. So they are at register transfer level, they are coarse grain reconfigurable and rather than implement boolean level functionality as standard cells do, they implement register transfer level vector operations as the basic core elements, as operations. They are characterized with post layout data and this empowers the synthesis from higher abstractions just the way standard cells empowered logic and physical synthesis. We argue that Salago blocks will empower algorithmic, application, and system level synthesis. Now, into Silago blocks wires, all of them, so all metal layer details are absorbed within Silago blocks. So there are no wires that needs to be created, synthesized after the design has been done. So everything, power, clock grid, everything gets created by abutment. Now just to emphasize that, this is the kind of animation. So you just place them on the grid and you get a valid VLSI design 
and then all wires get created by abutment and the cost metrics of the entire composite design becomes known with post layout accuracy. This is very vital for automating the synthesis. And very importantly, the end user doesn't need to have be a VLSI design specialist or need to use logic and physical synthesis tools. We did this once before when we introduced the standard cells, we eliminated the use of spice tools, circuit level simulation. We're arguing that time has come now to abandon the logic and physical synthesis from the part of the end user. Okay. So now an inspiration from the construction industry, like an analogy to reinforce what I've just said to you. So if you had bricks as a building block, it was pretty fair to say that you could build a single family home with it. But if someone told you that we're going to build a skyscraper with it, like this one, you would say that's very unreasonable, you would laugh at it. But that's exactly what we do today when we try to build half a billion gate designs using standard cells. So standard cells remain our atomic physical design building blocks, even 30 years after they were introduced. And that's the problem. So what, we, what can we learn from the construction industry? So when they wanted to build structures like that, how did they go beyond the bricks? Well, they adopted this thing called prefabricated wall segments. These are synchronous building blocks. They typically come in multiples of certain unit size. And very critically, they bring out the interconnect, all interconnect, the plumbing, the electrical, the telecom, the structural, all interconnects at right place. So that when the next prefabricated wall segment comes, it composes by abutment without any need for involving a carpenter or a plumber or an electrician. Just like the IKEA furnitures, they compose by abutment also, here you can compose them by abutment. Now many of you in the room, I'm sure, are thinking, well, isn't this similar to IPs? No, they are not. The reason is that IPs typically are soft and they logically compose. Even the hard IPs do not compose by abutment. You have to do a lot of VLSI carpentry and plumbing to connect two IPs together. And even if they did, these are meant as components to build a bigger wall. The IPs that we are used to in VLSI industry typically come for a complete solution for a complete wall, like a complete knob or a complete FFT. The building blocks here would be components of an FFT, components of a knob, components of a scratch pad fabric and so on. So there are some fundamental differences here between the IPs and the Silago blocks. So there is not one type of Silago blocks just like the Lego as an inspiration, it comes in many different themes. And just to make you laugh, it also panders to the needs of, you know, Trump family. Yeah. But on a more serious note, we're inspired by the drafts suggested, proposed in the Berkeley report on the landscape of parallel computing. So they propose these drafts to cover all possible kinds of high performance or all kinds of application domains. So very similar to that, we have built coarse grain reconfigurable fabrics that corresponds roughly to these Berkeley dwarfs. But to make a more complete system, we also need Silago blocks for infrastructural resources like the global NOS, the scratch pad, the PLLs, the IO pads, the DMAs, memory consistency controllers, everything. So we also need them as Silago blocks. So these becomes our basis for building things by other. Now, before I go further, let me sort of try to further expand on the difference between the hardware-centric and software-centric world. So traditionally, in the software-centric platform-based design, the traditional system on chips that we're used to, but default, the functionality is mapped to software. Software typically is two to four orders less, has inferior energy delay product compared to the hardware. And only the power and performance critical parts are moved to the accelerators. In the hardware centric world that we are promoting, the ASICs is done, how Silago ASICs are done. By default, we map things in a parallel distributed hardware style in the custom hardware made out of Silago blocks, not out of standard cells. And then only those 
flexibility critical control intensive non-deterministic functionality is mapped to the contrarian concept that we call as flexibilitas. And you would be surprised that my inspiration holds true. Lego also felt the need for flexibilitas and they surely have that as well, as you can see here. Okay, so these are the Lego flexibilitas and we also have similar flexibilitas in our saliva blocks to make the system complete. Now, Okay, something has gone wrong with my order of the slides, so let me just correct it. Okay. So let me explain to you why does the synchronous VLSI design style that I'm talking about works, whereas the standard cell-based design tooling doesn't work. Okay. So log back. We had full custom design and we were following Meet Conway's design methodology. We have six, seven layers of abstraction and the higher the abstraction layer from which you start, the more number of tools, so the more number of solutions would be possible. So this exponentially increases the higher the abstraction you start with. And this whole flow was manual. From system down to the transistor level, you were refining them manually, which essentially meant that the model there had to be verified that it is equivalent to the transistor level model below here. So the functional verification was very expensive, very difficult. We did using spy simulations. And then same thing, the cost metrics that you assumed here had to be proven that they are met here. So the constraints verification also had to be done. And this restricted it to 10,000 game design. It was, it was very hard to create more complex designs. So what did we do? We froze as a one-time effort all Boolean level design in the form of standard cells. So no one was allowed to design Boolean level logic ever. You only use pre-designed standard cells. And this was enormously helpful because it allowed us to automate from register transfer level down to the physical level, but the refinement from system level to RTL remained manual. And that manual thing was okay when the designs were a few million gates, but now when we are approaching tens to hundreds of millions of gates of logic, this is becoming unscalable. Now, we still have to verify because from here it is automated, so we only need to verify between system level and RTL level, and that's very expensive today because the designs are very complex. Now, since the design, we don't know the cost metrics until we reach the physical design, we still have to verify it only once we have reached there, so the constraints verification is still a problem. And these two verification is what is blowing up the cost to $300 million. And last time I heard that if we three nanometer designs are made, this would be something like one and a half billion dollars. Maybe these are some scary numbers, but this is one of the bottlenecks that we have why we can't do these custom designs. So what we're proposing is something very similar. What we're saying is that now let's move using Celago blocks to the physical level, to the register transfer level, so that as soon as a design is at register transfer level operations of the Celago blocks, you know the physical design and not just for the logic, but also for the wires. So every single wire segment, every single transistor, you know it as soon as a design has been refined down to register transfer level. We do it one better. We use a high-level synthesis tool, and then all your HPC libraries will be compiled, and now you have raised the level of physical design, the algorithmic level. So essentially, as soon as you know which algorithm and which degree of parallelism you're going to use, you know the physical design. Okay. Now, because we have exponentially reduced the design space, and this is a one-time engineering effort, automated, it becomes possible to automatically refine from system level down to this level. And because it is automated, yeah, just like you don't do the verification here, you don't have to do the verification there. So you don't have to do the functional verification. And because you know the physical design, you don't have to do the constraints verification either. So you have an end-to-end -end path for fully automated functional hardware design. Okay, so that's the difference between this style, which is a software-centric design style, and here, which is a hardware-centric ASIC-like design style. Now, how this has been used? So we have a proof of concept tool, and during the panel, I'll show you another more evolved version of this tool. So you have created a platform in terms of the different types of Celago blocks, you know that post layout data, you have some scripts. Now this is used to compile all your HPC libs. 
into a library. Each element here, each function here, each algorithm here is implemented in m different variants, architectures, parallelism. And then you use the same list to compose your HPC application, high performance applications, which could have L algorithms, which essentially means that there's M list to L possible solution. And this is where the co design happens. Every such solution implies its own custom interconnect and storage hierarchy. Yeah? And all of that gets composed like Lego bricks to create a valid physical design. Now, this is then created to create directly a mass patterns, so you can more or less literally email your tape out design to uh, the foundry. Now, so you get a design something like this, depending on the function, depending on the constraints. So these are all saliva blocks of different types. You have the global knocks, you have the TSVs, you have the system control and so on. So all of that gets created and not just this, but also the IO paths, the DFT structures, everything that is ready to manufacture. And you don't have to do logic or physical synthesis. Okay? You don't need synopsis, you don't need cadence. All right, now, how do you reduce the manufacturing cost? It's not just the design cost, but you can also reduce the manufacturing cost because all Silago designs are made up of a finite number of Silago block types. And each Silago block type can only have a finite number of valid neighbors. So what I can do is that I can do a one-time opt optical proximity correction mass component for each Silago block, depending on the neighboring type. And then I can compose the mass of an arbitrary design yeah, a valid mass pattern for an arbitrary design directly. This virtually eliminates the cost of engineering cost of creating a mass pattern. I can also do the DFT automation as a one-time effort because now the combinatorial logic is not arbitrary, it's not random. It's already done and decided and fixed. So all the test pattern generation is done as a one-time effort. In fact, I can compress it, store them on chip in a compressed format and reduce the time it spends on automatic test equipment, which can further reduce the cost. So what does this buy for me? Well, it's something like this. So this is uh, a work from uh, uh, Nachiket Capri from uh, University of Waterloo. So he has compared, you know, the DSP, the GPUs, the, the, the VLIW and Adaptiva parallel, parallel processor and also the FPGAs. And he found that the FPGA performs the worst, whereas they cost the most. The VLIW surprisingly costs the least and performs the best on a range of CNN benchmarks. So these are the per unit cost when you buy them in bulk of say 1000 or 10,000. So that's the cost of these chips as you can see for different things, solutions. And it's not surprising that the next uh, Xilinx platform for machine learning is completely a sea of uh, VLIWs. When you put them on the Silago based solutions, they're probably compared like two or three orders better than GPUs. And not only that, in small volumes of say hundreds to thousands, yeah, you can beat these solutions. And this is without factoring it into the, the lithography solution that I talked about. If I do eliminate the lithography engineering cost, this $200 would most likely become something like $10, $20. So if you get something which is cheaper than COTS and like two to three orders better than COTS, okay? Now, that was the first part of my talk. Second part is like, how do you complement this with these emerging technologies like the 2D, 2.5D and 3D integrations, memristors and plasmonics? So that's my second part of my talk. So Bayesian Confidence Propagation Neural Network has been researched by Professor Anders Schlansner, has developed it over a long period of time. It's a very biologically plausible model of cortex, has been validated uh, over a period of time. And we have taken that as a case study. So it has some requirements which are quite uh, supercomputer-like, uh, not really very high by the standards that you guys have seen been talking about like yesterday, like 170 teraflops per second for a human scale real time, 50 terabytes of synaptic storage, and the bandwidth is the most difficult one, 200 terabytes. And note that the spiking bandwidth is, you know, like uh, three orders less. And we all get fooled by this six type of benchmarks, now these numbers, these performance numbers. 
we always forget there's something called infrastructural numbers, which I call as the dark requirements, right? So like the dark energy, so there's these dark requirements which we all ignore, and they're very vital. Why? I'll show you in, in a slide, uh, a couple of slides later. So let me explain this uh, computational model of this BCPNN. Uh, so here, the atomic neuronal unit is, uh, is uh, like 100 particle neurons whose behavior is, uh, the behavior is similarly. So these are called micro or micro column units. And 100 of these micro column units, uh, mini column units are then uh, put into what is known as a hyper column unit, where these 100 mini column units, MCUs, compete in a winner take all fashion. So this is the synaptic matrix of it. Each column represents one mini column unit and it has 10,000 connections to other HCUs. So this is the synaptic storage. So what happens is that uh, it gets about 10,000 input spikes, the presynaptic spikes per second, but some of that has very high degree of temporal locality. And when an input spike comes, you fetch a row, you do the input spike computation and you put that row back. And if an output spike fires, then what you do is that you fetch a column, you do the output spike computation and put it back. So essentially, over a period of second, you read all the rows and all the columns, almost all of them, and then put it back. So it's a very memory intensive uh, application, as you can imagine. And the column updates are more expensive because row updates are easier. You fetch a complete page from a DRAM, to read a column, you have to read many pages and extract a small part of it. So the column updates are very expensive. And the other thing is that there's a very high temporal locality. So if a row is hit, there's a very, very high probability in the next few milliseconds it will be hit many times more. So both of these are known facts. Now, what I want to show you is that is the difference between the, infra, the functional operations, the 170 teraflops numbers that we all factor in, but also infrastructural operations, you have two million hypercolon processes non-deterministically concurrent. So coordinating them requires a lot of infrastructural operations and that is where these court solutions like GPUs, FPGAs and VLIWs fail because they use the same silicon to do this as it is to use this. So they underutilize it because these are not very difficult operations. They are mostly state machines, queues and things like that but they cannot be mapped to the same kind of hardware that is designed to accelerate only this part. And this is where ASIC gains, custom solutions gain. So the, applying the LEGO methodology to this as well, we have saliva blocks to do them, and then you can combine them, and uh, we have in, used the a 3D integrated DRAM uh, together with Professor Norbert Benz group in Kaiserslautern. So we have eight layers of DRAM that holds the synaptic storage for four hypercolumn units. All of them share a single microchannel. So two layers for one HCUs, so four HCUs in eight layers. Now, these are then integrated in a chip, which we call as a brain computational unit. And there are like about 32 edge cubes in it. And then you sort of use an interposer to integrate them further. So you have approximately 2,000 such uh, into one interposer. Yeah. So now, what happens is that let's when we, this has been implemented and benchmarks against the GPUs, very hand optimized code for GPUs. So ASIC implementation gives about something like one and a half millijoules per HCU per second, or if you look at the human scale, it's about three kilowatts of power. When you do that in the GPUs, it's roughly about uh, because it's four times lower, it's about two and a half megawatts. So it's about three orders better in terms of energy delay product. Yeah, so, and the Spinnaker, we have also mapped it to Spinnaker, the new version of the Spinnaker chip that has not been released, but we are in contact with the resident group and we found out the details, and it performs approximately comparable to GPU. So this is like enhanced ARM processor in it. So there are some accelerators for exponential and log and things like that. Okay, so this is, I think, what you gain. I mean, this is like a concrete proof that we gain three orders better compared to these uh, conventional cots and also some custom supercomputer like Spinnaker. Now, we can do further optimizations. So we can, as I said, like we can eliminate the column access because column access is the most difficult one. So whenever an output spike happens, we remember it. And then we piecemeal update it when we do the row updates. 
Okay, so we can eliminate the column, and this gives about 40% reduction in power consumption. But we can also exploit the temporal locality of this input spikes by having uh, a cache for that one, and this dramatically reduces the power. Approximately, like a, another, like you know, reduces like one third of that, quite significantly. And now you can see that the memory that was dominating here it becomes very small, and the computation starts to dominate. So it's about 800 watts for a biologically plausible human scale brain. Now this is very impressive because in, even in 28 nanometer bulk technology, it's not even an FTSOI, and sustained, not peak, you're getting 50 gigaflops per watt. Okay? If I have 7 nanometer fin fat that the uh, Fukaku is being used for, I can easily go to 500 gigaflops, if not to 1 teraflops per watt. Now, what is the next challenge? The next challenge is how do you, because the wires are very expensive, everyone talks about it, everyone knows about it, what can we do about it, okay? So the key so, uh, conclusion here is that it takes about, to move the data by one millimeter is equivalent to doing a, a single precision floating point operation and accessing just a single bit from a custom 3D integrated DRAM on chip. I'm not even going off chip. On chip, 3D integrated DRAM, one bit access is equal to 32 bit floating point operation. And this is a challenge that we need to address. How do we propose to do it? Well, we want to go beyond one Neumann in a true sense, not just accelerators. We want to use analog like computation in situ memory based computation using memristors where you can do dark products, where I think uh, the group from Michigan has told that you can extend it to do also addition. Another group in Milan has shown that you can actually do inversion and uh, things like that as well. As you can see, you don't need to fetch any instructions, decode it or execute it. The physics, the nature does the computation for you. Yeah. And now the challenges of course are that you have a huge power consumption still in the analog to digital conversion. The accuracy is a problem, which I think Subhashi says that is improving quite dramatically. But these some challenges remain. So what are we doing? How are we incorporating them as a Silago block? So what you're saying is that these will also become a Silago block for us. So we'll create a range of crossbar matrices with our supporting structures and characterized so that the synthesis tool can then do the trade-off. If I want to do a matrix operation on a conventional CGRA based solution, or if I do it on a SIM, which is better, and automatically know and instantiate and compose by abutment without the end user having the deep knowledge that is required to do a memristor-based computation in memory. Because this requires very specialized skills that are not even cadence and synopsis tools to help you. So by making them into a Lego brick, we're making it a co-design between such technologies feasible and possible. Yeah. Now, if I apply these memristor-based computation, what happens is that I can also go from floating point to integer point, which will uh, uh, fix point numbers that is self-reduced by a quarter, 250 watts. And if I abuse the memristors, we can very safely say that we would have a biologically plausible bottom electronic brain that consumes almost as much as this uh, human brain consumes, 25 volts. And that is very impressive because it's almost like 2 terahops per volt. Yeah, And that is also still in 20 nanometer bulk technology. How do we go beyond that? Well, the last part of my talk is that we're using these plasmonics. So CMOS, all these technology comes with the baggage of capacities. So charging them, discharging them slows you down. Now, to go beyond that, we are proposing to use wave-based computing using plasmonics, where you launch these plasmon waves in waveguides, and the interference is interpreted as a majority gate computation. You can also have a non-Boolean computation, and as we all know from the Boolean algebra, you can implement arbitrary Boolean logic using majority gate. So you can have three gate, five gates, seven gates, and first one. So uh, Professor Nani's group in EPFL has done wonderful work in logic synthesis using majority gates and many others have also done it. So what we're doing is that we're creating a hybrid computers using these plasmonics concept. So you have the CMOS where the control circuitry is, where the storage is. 
and then you have some very high speed circuit because you need to encode as phase the logic value ones or zeros so you need very you know very low jitter very high speed clocks that controls these plasma sources and creates these uh, plasmonic waves and then injects into the plasma computation substrate and the output of this is then again demodulated and brought back to the CMOS. Now as you can imagine that designing such a computer is beyond competence of most of us. I cannot design it. It sort of requires very specialist skills. So once again what we're saying is that we will break it down in terms of composable Silago Lego like bricks. Okay, and that's exactly what we're doing. We haven't done it, so this is just a conceptual thing that I'm showing you here. So all of this, CMOS, this high-speed CMOS, as well as the plasmonics, all of them are being made into Lego bricks. And remember that the nature of wave-based computing is such that you cannot just do logic synthesis. This logic synthesis has to factor in also the physical synthesis, and that's where the Lego and this composition by abutment concept shines through. And this would give us another 10x boost compared to what I have talked in the previous slides. So we have a very clear path that allows us to go 1000 to 10,000 times using just existing technologies. Add to that the graphene technology, that uh, nanotube technology that uh, Mr. Bashir was talking about. And we have a roadmap for going a million x compared to what the GPUs and the CPUs and the VLIWs and the FPGAs can deliver. Now, the impact, this is a visionary statement. I think a long time back, you know, we learned how to complement, supplement the human weak muscles to the muscles of the humans. But when we learned to mechanize the power and increase the power density by a factor of three and made it more affordable, we launched a revolution. Yeah, about 80% of people were engaged in agriculture or more, and now less than 5% of the people are engaged in agriculture. Yeah, was a complete change how the human society was organized. So what we're saying is that the software-centric GPU-based solutions already complements the human brain, but by providing a thousand x better, more dense computation power and more affordable by having a hardware-centric solution, we can again launch a similar revolution. Sorry if I sort of spoke a little too fast, but that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.